When one talks about the worst engines ever made, and in particular the worst diesels ever made, of course, the Oldsmobile diesel often enters into the conversation. Oldsmobile produced three different diesel variants from 1978 to 1985, including a 5.7 liter V8, a 4.3 liter V8 diesel that was offered for just one year, and a 4.3 liter V6 diesel. And all of them had their issues, but the 5.7 and 4.3 liter V8 diesels really had the most challenges until some very significant changes were made and a new block was introduced, a so-called DX block, in the early 1980s. However, there's a whole other diesel that General Motors produced that is probably even worse or close to at least being worse than the Oldsmobile diesel, and you may never have heard of it. And that is GM's Detroit Diesel Allison Division's fuel pincher diesel. It was 500 cubic inches and 8.2 liters used in medium-duty truck applications as well as buses. The fuel pincher diesel was introduced for the 1980 model year just as fuel economy was becoming of increasing importance for not only passenger vehicles but also for medium-duty trucks, buses, and heavier-duty vehicles and passenger cars. Hence its name and the focus really from an engineering standpoint was on a diesel engine that could help various operators conserve fuel. Now by this point, General Motors Detroit Diesel Division was known for producing quite a few reliable two-stroke diesels all the way back to when the division was created in 1938. In fact, back then there was a Detroit Diesel Division and a Cleveland Diesel Division. The latter made larger diesel engines that were also two-strokes, but mostly for applications like submarines as an example. Detroit Diesel focused on, if you can call it, smaller, but smaller diesels relative to the Cleveland Diesel Division. However, while these two-stroke diesels were often viewed as reliable and easy to rebuild, they weren't inherently fuel efficient. And one thing about them, they certainly tended to leak oil from many different orifices. In fact, they were painted green, and many called them the big green leakers. But regardless, Detroit Diesel wanted to come up with a more fuel efficient engine that was also an engine that could be sold at a lower cost so that operators could not only save on the upfront cost of the engine, but also fuel over its lifetime. Thus, the fuel pincher was born as a so-called modern four-stroke diesel as opposed to what Detroit Diesel was used to producing. And perhaps it's this foray into the four-stroke V8 diesels that really gave Detroit Diesel some challenges. It was an area that they just were not familiar with. And while many different truck manufacturers, including Ford, who was producing medium and heavy duty trucks at the time, quickly embraced the fuel pincher diesel because it was cheap to acquire as well as obtained high fuel economy, it was soon abandoned after it was known that these engines had quite a few different challenges. In fact, it's likely the fuel pincher's reputation that helped Detroit Diesel's on-road market share decline to just 3% by the late 1980s when Roger Penske formed a joint venture with General Motors and then eventually acquired Detroit Diesel and turned the whole business around and gained market share from 3% to 10% in just a couple years. Penske also didn't view this fuel pincher diesel as a great asset. In fact, he made General Motors keep producing the 8.2 liters, and wanted nothing to do with it. His Detroit diesel would produce the two-stroke diesels and also the new Series 60 engine, which actually would go on to be known as one of the more reliable and long-lived engines from Detroit diesel. So what was so bad about the fuel pincher diesel? It actually did get good fuel economy when it was operating, but one of the things that many operators discovered was that it just was not a long-lived engine. In fact, Rebuilds after about 130, 140,000 miles were relatively common. It certainly did not last nearly as long as other diesel engines did at the time. And it had a number of different failure modes. We're going to discuss those in a second, but I will point out one other issue that the fuel pincher had, and that was that it just didn't make really all that much horsepower. In fact, some of these 8.2 liter, 500 cubic inch V8 diesels made just 130 horsepower. And before somebody says, oh, but there's a lot of torque. No, they didn't even make a lot of torque. In fact, many of the fuel pincher diesels made around 350 pound feet of torque or even less. And that's just really not a lot when you're trying to pull a heavy load. 
There were some fuel pincher diesels that made up to about 250 horsepower that were turbocharged, and they made closer to 500 pound-feet of torque, and they were used in marine engines. But by and large, a number of the operators of fuel pinchers just were not satisfied with the horsepower that they put out at the time, particularly in naturally aspirated form. Now, what were the main shortcomings from a design perspective of the fuel pincher diesel? Well, they were myriad, but one of the main issues was a head gasket failure. And this owed largely to a couple things, not only the initial gasket design, but really the choice of Detroit Diesel when engineering this engine to have open deck freestanding cylinders. Take a look at this picture here and you can see what I mean by the open deck freestanding cylinders in this picture. And then compare it to a Caterpillar V8 diesel, a Caterpillar 3208. You notice a significant difference. Interestingly, Detroit Diesel tried to advertise this design, this open deck freestanding cylinder design, as being an advantage for the engine, in part because it allowed cooling to go all the way up to the top of the cylinders. And they claimed it provided some other advantages, including reduced block weight as well as noise control. Now, reduced block weight was really the reason behind Detroit Diesel's selection of this particular engine type for the fuel pincher. It did enable the block to be cast more easily and it was cheaper to build, but it did create a number of issues associated with the engine. Let's talk about these now. First, imagine a piston riding up and down within the cylinder walls. The first thing to remember is that as the piston goes up and down, it's pushing on different portions of the cylinder wall with different levels of force because of how it's connected to the crankshaft. So as an example, if the piston's riding up, it might, as an example, push on the right side of the cylinder wall as it's going down, it might push on the left side of the cylinder wall. So if these cylinder walls are not anchored well and are not rigid, they tend to walk back and forth by minute amounts. Now you can imagine that this, especially in a high compression engine like a diesel, might prove a problem. And in large part, this was one of the reasons for the head gasket failures in these fuel pincher diesels because the cylinder walls would kind of walk around a little bit each time the piston would go up and down within the cylinder. And this is why many more robust diesels did not employ this design, as I showed in a previous picture. Another issue associated with this fuel pincher diesel was something that was also a challenge on the Oldsmobile diesels, and that was that the engine just simply did not have enough and strong enough head bolts to retain the appropriate clamping force to make sure that that head gasket didn't blow and create a leak. Many reliable diesel engines at the time had about six head bolts per cylinder, and that enabled the head to be clamped down with the appropriate force needed to prevent the gasket from blowing, whereas the 8.2 fuel pincher just had four bolts per cylinder, and many of those were shared with the neighboring cylinder. So there were only 10 head bolts per head on either side of the engine, and that just wasn't enough. Some other competing V8 engines, like that Caterpillar 3208, had 18 head bolts per head. So there's almost double the number of head bolts on that Caterpillar 3208 V8 engine as there were on the Detroit diesel fuel pincher, just to give you an example. And so this created many, many different challenges with this fuel pincher. Not only did the head gaskets tend to blow because of inadequate clamping force, as well as the cylinder block design, but you also had quite a few hydrolocking issues because if the cylinder gasket blew in between the cylinders, which was the typical failure mode, or if it blew in a different location, coolant leaked into the cylinder, and then water is not compressible, so a rod would bend or the crankshaft would have an issue and then you'd have a pretty significant rebuild on your hands when it came to doing something with the fuel pincher. What's interesting as well about the block design that was selected by Detroit Diesel is that another infamous engine employed a similar philosophy and had the same issues as this fuel pincher, although it was a gas engine. And can you guess what it is? Here's a picture of its cylinder block. It's none other than the Chevrolet Vega, which of course was known as an engine that overheated and blew head gaskets, among other issues too. But unfortunately, the Vega as well as the fuel pincher share that cylinder block design with the open deck freestanding cylinders. This open deck design also caused problems for rebuilders because if you wanted to bore out the cylinders, 
you're effectively making the block weaker as you're taking material away, thus enabling a greater tendency for the cylinders to walk in their location and create more head gasket issues. If you overboard it and sleeved it, you would have some similar issues. So they really were tough engines to rebuild effectively so they didn't have failures. Another engineering challenge associated with these 8.2 fuel pinchers was the piston itself. More specifically, that it was really a short length with a small skirt on it. Now, a lot of long-lived and reliable diesel engines have very long piston skirts because the length of the piston skirt helps it really from cocking in the bore and thus creating uneven cylinder wall pressures as it rides up and down in the cylinder wall. This is why many diesel engines have skirts that are, in some cases, as large or as long as the cylinder bore to prevent this. Well, that was not the case with the 8.2 fuel pincher, and as you can see here, the piston skirt was very small compared to the piston skirt in a Caterpillar engine, as an example, and so that created greater cylinder wear and affected engine life. So overall, there were a number of challenges with the 8.2, everything from the power not being that great, the torque not being that great. In fact, in its lowest horsepower torque configuration, the engine made just 130 horsepower and 318 pound-feet of torque, which really is not much for either of those values. But beyond the lack of power, it had some inherent issues that really just weren't cured and also made it challenging to rebuild such that the engine could be put in service reliably. And again, I hypothesize that this 8.2 fuel pincher was one of the prime reasons that Detroit Diesel lost considerable market share during the early to mid-1980s before Roger Penske really rescued it and recovered Detroit Diesel and helped it gain share once again. Now, part of that was because Detroit Diesel in 1987 introduced the Series 60 engines, which really were quite good engines, and Penske kind of came in at the right time when those engines had been developed. But, hey, half of success is really luck and timing, and I think beyond that, a lot of people would argue that Roger Penske took Detroit Diesel to a whole new level. In any event, perhaps the coolest part about the fuel pincher was its logo, and I don't know really what that says about the engine, but the logo certainly is pretty cool. GM's design team came up with, uh, well, a good-looking logo. So cool that I even found this cap on eBay, and I'm going to proudly wear it around town. So if you see somebody wearing a fuel pincher diesel hat in your town, it's probably me. Thanks again for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, be sure to comment and like and subscribe. Until next time, take care.